questions, if they have any questions. They're elected, councils are elected to ask questions of the Melvin, so I just wanted to demonstrate. Um, I'm sorry about this day that it happened, um, and I'm sorry to me, because I'm supposed to be an advantage for the legislature, because we never have, the council never set a hearing to this day, but it is what it is. Um, a lot of the questions have been asked because I'm the last um, I, I So you have 70% civil and 30% criminal. Well, when I filled out the judicial application, Councilor, it was uh, 7 to 30. I think I made reference in the Governor's Council questionnaire that given the last year or beyond, it's more, more like 50-50. Well, I first wanted to get it out of the way that um, I did apologize to you that you missed the four o'clock. <laughs> you don't have to apologize. You went to well, 11 o'clock mass by Christmas Day and it was right. wonderful. Well, we met Saturday and it was four hours and I said, he's never going to make it. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't, even, I didn't even try. And as I said, 11 o'clock mass was fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm glad for, I'm glad for that. It turned out that way. Uh, just a few things uh, that I was just curious about. Casios, is that P A T S I O S? Oh, I no. guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Casio, P A I X. Oh, okay. It sounded like a a people, there's a whole bunch of people with that name in, in uh, Watertown. And Bethany is right up the street from me. But I do want to say um, I have four children. I have two boys and two girls. And uh, we're BC. So that's the rivalry between Holy Cross. And I have to say, I have two grandchildren who graduated from BC. I got me out of was 10. So. <laughs> uh, but I, I do, uh, um, I do want to say that um, uh, I like your age, your life experience that you're bringing to the court. I'm especially concerned about drugs, as we all are. Sure. And um, this past year, I've had two very close friends who lost sons of heroin dose. So I, I know it's sure. real. Now, um, you know, you say that this is going to be a big contribution that you're going to give as a judge uh, of the development drug addiction. Um, when you have a person that's drug addicted before you, uh, what, will you what can you do as a judge? Well, and, and when I say a, a big contribution, what I think one of the things that I have uh, that I can bring to the bench if I'm confirmed is that I have a certainly an understanding of it from a family standpoint, from a personal the personal family uh, standpoint, and in my involvement in the Love of Cares Coalition and the Michael J. Dias Foundation and the Hennepin County Addiction Task Force. So I think I bring a, a certain knowledge level that perhaps other uh, district court judges may not have. Uh, but I, I, I think if somebody is coming in front of me, I, I think I will bring that, that knowledge base to dealing with that person, whether it's for sentencing or, or what have you. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned. <coughs> I'm very concerned about the lack of drug treatment centers. And uh, a lot of legislation passed in the federal court. You know, my friend's sons, if they had a good drug treatment center, they'd probably be alive today. And, uh, and, and, and it's a shame on this state house. There is, in fact, there's none in Western Mass, although I, I did speak to our, our Sheriff Nikoshi, and, he's, and he said that this could be stated, that he's uh, right now he's negotiating with Western Mass Hospital to come up with somewhere between 40 and 50 beds for him. Well, he works with my Sheriff, Sheriff Nikoshi, and uh, I think that he's appropriate there. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that uh, Sheriff Nikoshi is uh, very big on going after the drug addiction. Um, so, um, our district app to process, I'm always concerned about that. You, this is your fourth time you applied? Uh, no, actually my third. Uh, I, I applied in 2013, but there were two positions at the same time. There was a, an opening for Plato District Court and the Northampton District Court that you applied for. Did you apply once for the two you went in? Yes. So that, That's okay, because right. it chose three. Right. Okay, so, um, did you get thrown? I, I, in, the, in 2013 and 2015, those applications, I, I didn't get 
Section 35 process is where somebody, and, and there's really a, a kind of a, a two problems. One is that somebody is in the throes of some kind of substance abuse disorder, and that they have, a, that there's an imminent likelihood that they're going to harm themselves or somebody else. Once those two problems are met under Section 35, then the person can go into district court either voluntarily or involuntarily, sometimes via an arrest, um, and the person is evaluated by the court clinician in the district court, and then if that uh, court clinician determines that this person does fit the guidelines of Section 35, that person will then go in front of the district court judge, who will oftentimes um, adhere to what the court clinician is finding, but it would be the, the district court judge who would send that person to a Section 35 facility. Tell me about Annabelle uh, Calhoun. Uh, well, Annabelle Calhoun, pardon? That's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, very good friend of the family's. Uh, she went to Smith College uh, along with my oldest daughter. They played soccer for four years. Annabelle has been to, to our house many times. Uh, something sticking in, in your head like it was yesterday. I was on, somebody mentioned golf. I was on the 17th hole at Westover on Sunday morning and got a call from Annabelle. And she had been uh, arrested the night before. She was involved in, in a relationship with another student at Smith. Um, there had been some drinking involved. And there was uh, an argument uh, in, the, I think in the other person's parking lot of the person's apartment. And that led to a physical altercation. The police were, were called, I think it was from a neighbor, and Annabelle was arrested. Uh, it, it, it was a very kind of a complex case, even though the charge itself was not complex. The charge was assault and battery on a uh, family or household member. And the statute allows that somebody's in a dating relationship that fits within the category of that assault and battery on a, a household family member. But what, what made it especially difficult is that she was a graduate student. She had graduated from Smith. She was a graduate student in the School of Education. And she was practice teaching in Northampton. And she was part of a, a program called the Project Coach, where she was um, teaching inner city youth soccer, uh, some, some boys and girls in Springfield. But it was the Project Coach piece of her schooling that funded her schooling. So once the arrest came in, she was immediately taken out of the practice teaching. She could not practice teach, and she could not participate in the project coach. That had some dire potential consequences because it would have meant she would not have been able to, to complete the program financially. So we, we had the criminal side of it, and, and I was dealing uh, with the assistant DA, Lori Moderna, who was phenomenal to, to deal with. Um, on the criminal side, also Mary Beth Costello in the 
probation department in Northampton. So we were able to fashion a, a sentence with a number of probationary conditions under what was called Chapter 276, Section 87, which is a rather, in layman's terms, kind of a slap on the wrist, but with a number of probationary conditions that protected the victim in that case. And then we then moved that criminal disposition over to Smith College, and we had to have a number of uh, meetings with um, uh, one of the deans, Danielle Randap, who was very helpful, but trying to educate them on what that criminal disposition meant. And thankfully, she was able to return to her practice teaching, return to the uh, project coach portion of, of her graduate program, and she completed the degree. She's now teaching in Brooklyn, New York. We were just talking to her via FaceTime on Christmas night. It, it was a very complicated matter, but a lot of people came together to come up with, I think, a just result. Oh, that was great. I'm sorry that I'm the last counselor to give that, but you're, you're, I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, so um, uh, let me ask you, what was the most serious criminal case that you had? <clears throat> I, I guess it depends on, on, on what you, well, let me say this. Well, I mean, the uh, severity. Yeah, I, I actually would say in some respects it was the Annabelle Calhoun matter, just because there was such wide-ranging implications. If it was just the assault battery on a, not, not to, I don't mean to minimize the assault battery on a family or, or household member, but then you have the, the school side of it, the, the coaching and the teaching, and it had to bring a lot of different people together. And I have to say, it was, it, it, was, it was a time-consuming case. Uh, we also had her, her mom calling me regularly from, from Brooklyn, as you can imagine. So while, it, while in terms of the seriousness of the charges, just the criminal charges, when you added in everything else that was at stake, it, it became a very serious case. Thankfully, not that what it ended up in a serious What was the most disappointing of Sounds a little strange, but probably the most disappointing case was the case that it won. Uh, that was a case of um, the Office of Child Care Services versus, uh, and, and I'm okay with listing, mentioning names. Not by name. Not by name. Uh, it was a case involving the Office of Child Care Services brought a, a matter against my client who uh, operated a, a licensed daycare in Western Mass and was accused of improper touching some of the children. Devastating. She came into my office. I had never gone through this before. One of the things that I, I uh, talked to her right from the start was, would you undergo a lie detector test? Absolutely. We ended up uh, hiring a, a lie detector specialist who came in. She was found to be truthful in the lie detector test for whatever, um, you know, whatever value that is. And, and they're, they're not allowed in the courts. But then we had, and, and there was a lot of a lot of discovery. We finally went down to Boston for a two-day uh, hearing in front of the administrative law judge. We won the case at the administrative uh, appeal. The administrative law judge ordered the Office of Child Care Services to return the daycare license. But before we did that, we had to go. In those days, it was DSS. I think it's DCF now. In those days, it was DCF. We had to go for a fair hearing. And that was a two-day hearing in Springfield. Uh, we did first day of hearing, and at the end of the first day, a fair hearing officer, an employee of DSS, threw the case out. Uh, she never opened up her, her daycare license. She was broke. So we won the case. So I, I think to, to answer your question, that was probably the most disappointing. It was a case that we won, yeah. and, 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 and she looked right at me, and at the time, my children were Young, and she looked right at me and she said, You bring your children to me? There's always that doubt. And she said, Parents will come. What was the most rewarding thing? I had no count. Just because. Especially in winter. Oh, my yeah. She was, during the time that she was at Smith, she was like the fourth daughter. Yeah. Um, you didn't have a case. Um, uh, 
this group being functional. We know what the problem is with the fans and questions that have all these frustrating things. You don't know the rest of the story because you can't put it all in here. Right. So you're left with, well, what happened? It was a set piece. What happened to this person? You know? Well, now, and I think I did mention in my judicial application is that I, I don't have some of the details in terms of names. I thought I would mention names here anyway, but because I don't have access to the district attorney's office. But when I was a district attorney, assistant district attorney, there was a family who came from Russia, moved into Springfield, uh, next door to a um, just a not nice family. Uh, I mean, there's other terms I could use I won't well, use here. Right. Well, very much so. Yeah. And they took it upon themselves to completely harass this family from Russia who simply wanted to live their life. Yeah. They came here for a better opportunity. Um, in those days, there was a relatively new civil rights violation charge that, that we brought a case on. It was, I think it was the first time we had used that, that case, that, that uh, the charge of civil rights violation uh, in the criminal session. We went in front of Judge Kenneth Cody on a jury waive because the defense attorney was absolutely convinced there's no way you've met the standards. You, can't prove this case, and Judge Cody, after a, you know, a, a fairly substantial case with, with a lot of back and forth, found that individual guilty of violating the civil rights. So case. what was the? Uh, I mean, there, there was a, a sense. I, honestly, I don't think the person went to jail. No, they don't. Uh, I don't. I don't, I don't think, think so. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering what it was. Now, um, okay, you talk about good judges and bad judges. Well, and, and, and I believe what I said in the application is I have come across in the 25 years or so, come across a few, not many, um, and, and I don't know that I would even call them bad judges necessarily. Maybe I had them on a bad day. But I think one of the things that, that I've seen as that characteristic of judges who, want, again, I won't say they were bad judges, but again, maybe having a bad day, is they kind of forget. Well, lack of empathy for sure, but they kind of forget that they were in my shoes not too long ago. And, and hopefully, if I'm confirmed, hopefully that's something that I, I don't forget. That I was there, and, and it had to do with Consular Ionella asking the, the question about continuance. That hopefully I'm going to remember that I was in that position. One of, one of the, I think, good things about practicing in Western Massachusetts is it's a relatively small bar. So I'm going to know, if you're coming in front of me, I'm going to know, because I've had you on other cases or I've heard, I'm going to know if you're, if you're telling me a, a story or if you, you honestly have a, you know, a, a situation. And, and again, I, I, I would hope that I would remember that I was in your shoes not too long ago. Uh, you mentioned empathy, compassion. I think those, those are some of the things. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the reason I'm sitting in this chair is because of the family. I 
Uh, I personally have never run into a an attorney who has that I'm aware of that has counseled a client to make something up. They're signing an affidavit and obtaining penalties of perjury. I haven't seen that. I mentioned that that case about the pregnant girl. There was no attorney on the other side. Okay. Um, how do you feel your um, your elected positions uh, help to make you a more effective um, I'll, I'll say it, it in one phrase and then I'll pass because I can make decisions. Uh, one of the things that I think that has been a change in the district court judge job is how many hearings they have. So if you've got 209A, you've got uh, 58A dangerousness hearings, you've got 258, uh, 258E harassment orders, you've got license to carry hearings, you've got Section 35 hearings, Section 12 hearings, extreme risk protection order hearings. Those are things that a judge has to sit in and ultimately, number one, have a judicious temperament, be impartial, and in the end, make a decision. Now, that woman to your right who spoke earlier knows I'll make a decision. She may not always agree with my decision, and they, they may not always be right, but I'm going to ask a lot of questions of people that come in front of us here. She is shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, people that come in front of the board of select. Many times people that I know on, on both sides. So you have to try to get as much information as you can, and then in the end, you have to make a decision. And that's I, I can understand it because I, I was on that uh, city council for many years, and I had come from the town meeting. So uh, I know, and we have to go into executive session of the sewing and everything. So I got into all of that. Um, you know, in making a decision, so I can understand the fact that you have to make information, right. and you have to have integrity. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, I, I like I said, I, I think I've, I've really gone through. Um, I, I checked out everything in the last thing, and the thing called the last again is uh, kind of easy because uh, you have the questions that are being asked. But it was a pleasure meeting you. show sensitivity in their spoken words to 
circumstance or not, that's a question that can be stories who have no expectations of the law and expect a kind of confidence. Of course, you there's the service that we spend a lot of time to try to work with you. And uh, there was also uh, a letter from uh, Judge Mulcahy that I had probably because it was so relevant. Counselor, I, I don't know if you mentioned that Judge Manhattan. Yes. Okay, a colleague. And we went over this when the time is right. Very nice. Very nice letter from Mayor Saunders. School. 
and Isaacs group is international. So I gave up my position as Craig's pastor a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Bill, you do a great job. Um, you have the temperament and demeanor, which to me is the most important thing. Because I can remember back when my father or I were faced with judges who weren't the good judges. And uh, so it's just nice to think that you have someone who is respectful and a student of the law and isn't afraid to say, but don't ever say, oh, no. Okay, just say, I'm going to take a piece of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.